know Him? How much of Him do we know? And do we want to know Him more? To know Him better? To know Him deeper? And in the end, fall in love with Him who first loved us. Welcome to Know Him Ministry. Join us live with our Bible study every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Here, we study the Bible and the three angels' message with the ultimate goal of knowing Him, His grace, His mercy, and His love. Good evening, viewers. Welcome to Know Him Ministry. Once again, I am Kai, and I'm delighted to learn with you, to grow with you in this journey. We are on our seventh lesson of our Bible study series, which will be viewed online via our Facebook page and YouTube channel, Know Him Ministry. Follow us online for our live Bible study guide coverage every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Melbourne, Australia time. And with us here is Brother Randy, who will not only be leading us in opening our Bibles, but most importantly, in understanding the words we read. Welcome, Brother Randy. Thank you, Sister Kai, and good evening to you and to all our viewers. Welcome again to our program tonight. We are on lesson number seven. Welcome you all. And hopefully, with God's grace, we will learn more about Him tonight. And for our viewers, we want you to be a big part of this. So if you have questions about our topic or has a specific topic in mind that you want to study further, feel free to send us a message in our contact details posted on our screens. We also offer personal Bible studies just hit us on direct message. And now, let's get ready with our Bibles, highlighters, notepads, sticky notes, and pens, because it's study time. Brother Randy, would you like to do our opening prayer before we will start? Let us invite all our viewers and each one that let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that again we have this time to spend with you and with each other as we open the pages of the scripture we also like to open the pages of our hearts so that we can understand we can discern things that belongs to us and for our future and into that eternal home that you have prepared for each one of us be with us tonight as we study your your bible the subject tonight that we're about to engage and so be with us and forgive us from all our sins this we ask in jesus name amen amen tonight we will find the way to eternal life there's only one way the bible is very clear and we will study that tonight because we cannot reinvent the way god made prepare a pathway a path a way that will lead us to eternal life sister kai will be dealing tonight in this lesson the way to eternal life okay, please get ready with your bibles we will have our first question for our bible study tonight the first question is how many human beings have sinned? This is a really good question. Let's go to the book of Romans. That's in the New Testament. The book of Romans chapter 3 in verse 23. Paul wrote a letter to the Christians in Rome. How many human beings have sinned? Romans chapter 3 in verse 23. I'll be reading in the New International Version, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many human beings have sinned? The Bible is very clear. All. All have sinned and fall short to the, of the glory of God. 
See, from Adam, the fall of humanity, that fall, we all fall short from then onwards. And the Bible say, all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God. For our second question, what is the punishment for sin? Now, it's a little bit harsh question, this one, but it is a question that needs to be answered. Because if all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God, that sinning, what is the punishment of that sin? So let's go to again in the book of Romans. Paul elaborate further in chapter 6 in verse 23 what he started in chapter 3 now he elaborated a little bit in chapter 6 in the book of Romans Romans chapter 6 in verse 23 what is the punishment for sin Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord now this verse let's focus on it a little bit more it says what is the punishment for sin paul said for the wages of sin is death now when you receive wages you don't receive it for nothing because it's a wages that you labor for so wages is a term that paul uses in his time when there is an exchange the same as today you will receive wages but wages must have an exchange value so the wages of sin we must have work for somebody else's to receive that wages you see it's clear in the bible that planet earth when it was handed over to lucifer when Adam and Eve surrendered, hand over the dominion to Satan and prefer to follow Satan rather than the word of God, human being is subject to the new employer. And so when you work for that new employer, you will receive that wages. And your employer is sin because Satan is the origin of sin. He is a sinner from the very beginning. There was sin found in his heart while he was still in heaven. He is the sin. The sin. And so if you work for him, God said, for the wages of sin is death. But, you say, I love this verse. I love this word. You see, when you say in the word, but, this is a turning point. But is another way out. For the wages of sin is death. But, Jesus said, Paul said, the gift of God is eternal life. Inspiration continued to express that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there was this in. You must be in Christ so that you will receive that gift though there is a wages of sin is death you see this verse is not the wages of sin death that we experience now when you stop breathing the bible is very clear that the death that lazarus gone into is only a sleeping Jesus will come and will wake them up. But that chapter 6 of the book of Romans, in verse 23, this death is eternal death. It is the wages of sin. And then you have the other side, the much better, greater, wider, more profound that God has given as a gift of humanity is the gift of God which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Okay, let's get on for our third question. How can we receive this eternal life? Let's go into the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, to answer this question. Okay, I'll read Acts 16, 
verses 30 to 31. The book of Acts is in the New Testament. It says, He then brought them out and asked, Men, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They is a situation that in this verse alone the question is how can we receive eternal life it's a very simple answer believe in the lord jesus christ and you will be saved you and your household but let us remember that there is no evidence in the bible that says that once you believe you are always a believer no because believing when you will suspend yourself from believing when you, you refuse to self to believe when you were a believer previously but now you abandoned that belief you no longer a believer you have no eternal life because as it is said believe in the lord jesus christ and you will be saved is not only you but also your whole household so the believing is a continuous progressive believing put into action believe in the lord and you will be saved amen let's continue with our bible study for our fourth question who did Jesus say will have eternal life? All right, let's go in the book of John in chapter 3. Again, still in the New Testament. John chapter 3 in verse 16. Oh, this is one of my favorite verses, Brother Randy. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life here this is the verse of quantification or quant to quantify for how many will be saved or will have an eternal life now this word whoever believes immeasurable beyond a human counting ability no one can put any ratio and proportion because God said for for so God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son now here we have the beyond measure the scope of how many whoever as long as you believe in Jesus guaranteed Jesus said will not perish but have everlasting life Okay, let's go to our fifth question to answer. What happens when we choose Jesus to guide our life? What happens to a person? When you choose to guide your life, when you choose Jesus to guide your life. Let's go in the book of Psalm, chapter 51, verses 7, and then we'll jump into verse 10. So Psalms, chapter 51, in verse 7 and then we move to verse 10 okay i'll read psalm 51 verse 7 first cleanse me with the hassle and i shall be clean wash me and i shall be whiter than snow now in verse 7 it says cleanse me so what happens when you choose jesus so jesus had a cleansing power that only him can provide nobody else's cleanse me with the high soap now it is a mint it is a it is a plant that has a a minty kind of a thing but it is a cleansing power and i will be clean and then said wash me and i'll be whiter than snow let's go in verse 10. verse 10 it says create in me a pure heart O god and renew a steadfast spirit within me this is something that we must ask God you see Jesus said ask and it shall be given unto you knock and it shall be opened 
This is one of the best verses that we can ask God to create inside me, to create in me a pure heart. When God will cleanse you from all sins and from all the things that should not be done because it's a wrong thing to do, Jesus guaranteed that I will cleanse you. I will make you as white as snow. And when it happens, the cleansing, the next thing to do is create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me that you can stand. Ask God a spirit that you can stand because when you believe Jesus, when you believe Jesus, the discouragement will be here and everywhere. But with God, when He creates you a pure heart, God will create a new spirit, a new heart, and a steadfast spirit within you. Let's get ready with our Bible in the New Testament for our sixth question. What does God do when we honestly confess our sins? All right, let's go to the book of the first John. So the first John chapter 1 in verse 9 in the New Testament. John, first John, so this one, two, three John, but we'll open the, the first book, first John chapter 1 in verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness so what does God can do when we honestly confess our sins in this way God can do nothing else he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness this is the mighty power of Jesus that He can give to every believer, those who believe, and if we confess to Him. But friends, when you confess your sins, confess it personally. Sometimes a public confession would be a very, a very nasty experience to some. But if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just. Confess it to him personally. Go to your closet. Just like Daniel, he went into his own room and opened his heart to God and confesses all the sins of his fathers and of his people and of himself. He confesses the sin and then God has, not, has no power to say no, but he's got all the power to say yes. I will forgive all your sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is what God can do if we confess our sins. Let's continue with our next question. How does Jesus describe the conversion experience? Say, how did Jesus describe, show in a demonstration that we are a new creature. John chapter 3 in verses 3 to 7. How did Jesus describe this conversion experience from being an unbeliever to become a believer? From an old man to become a new man, an old creation to the new creation. What experience, what conversion that is that Jesus has described. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 3 in verses 3 to 7. Okay, I'll read. John is still in the New Testament. Verse 3, it says, In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked, Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Verse 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. In verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. 
And the last verse, which is seven, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. So the question is, how does God do when we honestly confess our sins and how did he describe that process? It says, you must be born again. Nicodemus did not understand this kind of an emblem of being born again. How can I be born again? Jesus said, you must be born again in the water and by the Spirit. It is a form of a baptism. Burying your old life. That you no longer the man before but now you are a new person a new creation under the leading of god you see the way to eternal life is no longer my way or our way the way to eternal life is jesus way my way and our way will one day bring us death. But the way that Jesus wants you to follow is the way Jesus created. You must be born again. No other option. You must be born again. When you are born with water and in the spirit, you become a new creature. Your old being is buried into that watery grave. And when you're out from that watery grave, you become a new, a new being, a new person. Okay, my next question, Brother Randy, is how does the Bible describe a converted person? That's a really good question. Let's read the book of Corinthians. Let's go to the second Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 17. Okay, it says here, still in the New International Version that I am reading, 2 Corinthians 5.17. 5, it says in here, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Now, you were baptized into the watery grave. When you come out, you are a new creation. But listen in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ. So when you are in to the water. Now listen carefully. When you are in to the water, you are in Christ. So you are buried with Christ. Into the watery grave. You die yourself dead yourself becomes dead you die in christ and you die with christ and then when you come out you become a new creation and that new creation has come the old person is gone you become the new creature let's see for example the old person is very nasty in his words the new creation is very loving and very kind and uh, he chooses his words pleasant to the hearing of anybody the old guy the old man used to be drunk every day and becoming a nuisance to the neighbors and uh, to the society but when he become a new creation he is no longer the person that you know he is changed a new person has emerged now the new is here Okay, let's go to the next question. Our ninth question for our Bible study tonight. Where does God write His will in our life? All right, let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. Okay, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. It says... In verse 10. And in verse 10. Okay, it says... This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after the time declares the Lord. 
I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now, when a person becomes a new person, when that person is in Christ, you are claimed by God as his own. This is an honor and a privilege being part of God's family. God said, I will be their God and he will be my people and you will be my people and he or she be my people. You are part of God's people. When you become part of God's family, you become part of God. Now, this is the situation. Previous verse, the previous phrase it says, before becoming, when you become part of God's family, God will write something in your heart. He will write that something, what we call a covenant. An agreement. An agreement that when you take Jesus as your Savior, you will proclaim to the universe the word I do. You become part of Him and Him part of you. You become one flesh with Him. Something like a marriage vow. So this covenant will write, will be written in the hearts of a person as a new creation, as a new person. When that person will say, I do, and will believe Jesus, and then had a pure and clean heart, and a stead, steadfast spirit, you can stand in all forms of extremities and temptations, you become a new creation, God will write His covenant in your heart. So Brother Randy, when we become a converted person, my follow-up question is, how does God feel toward us when we are already a converted person? Let's ask the Bible and let's read the Bible. How does God feel toward us? Let's go to the book of Micah, a very beautiful book in the Old Testament. Micah in chapter 7 in verse 19. I'll How read... does God feel towards us? Okay, I'll read Micah chapter 7 verse 19. It says, You will again have compassion and ask. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our inquiries into the depths of the sea. You see, how does a God feel towards us? When we confess our sins and we bury our sins in that watery grave, Jesus said, the Bible said, God again has loved us, compassion. Compassion on us. God has a compassion. This is the feeling of God. For God loved the world. His compassion is on us. And when He will look at our sin, He will forget our sins. He will forgive and He will treat us as if nothing has happened. And then our sin, we will treat our sins underfoot. Because sin and sinner will be burnt with the mouth of the word of God and the fire will burn them and they become ashes and we will treat them with our foot and our iniquities will be buried down into the depths of the sea. That's how much love and compassion God has for us. We are down to the last question of our topic tonight. How willing is God to forgive our sins? Let's go in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and verse 12. Is God really willing to forgive our sins? Hebrews, chapter 8 in verse 12. 
Hebrews is in the New Testament. Let's read Hebrews 8, 12. It says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. What a beautiful wow. promise. This is the best part of God. I may be personally as a person difficulty in forgiving someone. Maybe you can forgive, but you cannot forget. But see, God, in His wisdom, in His compassion, and in His love, He said, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no, no. more. He will not remember our sins. But sometimes you ask the question, how really willing God to forgive our sins? If the scars on his head and the hole in his hand and the stripes in his body under the hands of the cruel Romans and because of our sins, that mark in his body will remind him throughout eternity the sinfulness of sin. You see, God carried those marks in his body not because he loves your sin but he loves you and me as a sinner and those marks will remain in his body throughout eternity because it is our study of how depth and how wide and how high is the love of God towards men. He is willing to forgive our wickedness and He will remember your and my sin no more. For our viewers, for our reflective question for tonight, can you appreciate how God really wants to save you? And is it your desire to ask Him to guide your life from this day onward? We want to answer that question, yes, Brother Sister Randy. Kai, it is a reflective question that somehow we have to look at in the eye of God. Far down that hill of Golgotha, as we look back 2,000 years ago, that man named Jesus carried the cross down the streets called Via Dolorosa, all the way to Golgotha, then to the hill called Mount Calvary, taking yours and my sin upon himself. And he opened his arms so wide and said, this is how much love I have for you. He gave his life, he gave his all so that we can be saved whole. He gave his own. That's how I appreciate God wants to save you. The Bible is clear. There is a way that seemeth good to man, but the end thereof is death. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Who No one can go to the Father except through me. To appreciate the love of God is to look at the man Jesus hang on the cross to die for us because he liked to save you and to save me from sin and from the wages of sin that is death so that he can give you and he can give me eternal life. Thank you, Brother Randy. Thank you everyone for joining us. We are all learners at the feet of Christ. We want you to be a big part of this. So if you have questions about our topic or has a specific topic in mind that you want to study further, feel free to send us a message in our mobile number 0437 and you may follow us in our Facebook page to join us live every Friday at 7.30 p.m. 
for our Bible study series here in Know Him Ministry. Let's close our study with a prayer. I would like to invite everyone to join us. We praise you, O Lord God, for your guidance tonight as we study your words, as we study the Bible. Thank you for guiding me and Brother Randy as we go along with our Bible study. We thank you also, O Lord God, for the viewers who have joined us in our study tonight. Bless us as we continue to worship you, as we continue to praise you, O Lord God. And may it be that the desire in our hearts to receive and accept that love that you have given us will keep on burning each day as we continue to wait for your second return. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers and for forgiving us of all our sins. In Christ's loving name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for our viewers. See you again next week here in Know Him Ministry where we study the Bible and the three angels' message with the ultimate call of knowing Him, His grace, His mercy, and His love.